Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. Today, I've got my man, Wayne Brown. He is a professor at the University of Buffalo, a mental health advocate, and uh, not only a social worker, but also teaches it at that same University of Buffalo. And today, we're going to talk about two, I think, key critical topics for us, uh, effective communication and what is it, and then effective discipline and what is it. Uh, Wayne, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Let's jump right in. So effective communication, we were talking a little bit off air. Yeah. So uh, what is effective communication? Effective communication is the ability to speak and receive information equally from your child, regardless of age. It starts all the way at the earliest with the most unimportant blathering all the way up to and through our children graduating high school and college and hopefully maintaining communication with us as they become adults. Effective communication is everything and it's kind of like the layers of an onion. If you're not building the important layers at the beginning, then the outer layers are going to become more and more warped. You had a really great example that we were discussing off air and we'll get to that, but what is at the center? Like what's at the center of effective communication? At the center of effective communication is truthfully and honestly caring about what your child is saying, caring about what your child is experiencing. Um, it's the ability to put down what you're doing and listening to your child, even if it is for a few minutes, even if you are super busy. I know a lot of us dads are working from home uh, since COVID. And sometimes we, <laughs> we kind of get drunk on our own importance. Hmm. And we feel like we're doing a task for uh, either our own work that we do or for a boss or for a spouse or whatever. And it's the most important thing in the world to get this done right now. And I know you want to tell me this thing about Roblox, but number one, I don't care. And number two, I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. And number three, if I don't have this report done in the next two hours, my boss, my spouse, my whomever is going to yell at me and I just don't want to deal with that. Mm. And when we break that communication, when we tell our child we're too busy to watch a 30 second YouTube video or to listen to their story about a Roblox character or to hear about what the kid did to them on the playground, we are breaking off communication. We are making communication between us and our child more difficult. And it is those earliest conversations that are so fundamental in growing the communication between us and our children. Um, I remember when my kids were little, they, my kids are no different than your kids and the next person's kids they tell us a lot of stories that you cannot possibly comprehend. And unless I was handling nuclear waste at the time, which I never was, I would stop what I was doing for usually they needed less than one minute of my time to be heard, to feel heard. Was I richer for it? Did I learn the keys to the unlocking the universe? Absolutely not. But they were richer for it. And mm -hmm. now today, years later, my kids do come and have more difficult conversations with me. So the payoff in listening to their stories wasn't for then. It was for the future going forward. I'm thinking a lot about my youngest right now, uh, 19 months you know, super young and babble talking at the kitchen mm -hmm. table, just blah, 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 like complete nonsense mm -hmm. and, and just practicing a conversation and just practicing responding to her in English. You know, my wife does it 
Uh, even my oldest now does it. So my oldest is 12 and will respond in some way, like speaking back English, asking clarifying questions, making making statements and back there just to, to play that. And I think a lot about as well, what you were saying, I remember when we moved out here, so out here, I moved to Nashville last last year. And so we've been here about nine months and my daughter started to listen to some new kinds of music. And I was just saying in my head, I was like, I, you know, I remember the first couple of times I was like, this is weird. Like, I don't really like it. And then I thought back to when I was a kid and it was like, when I was a kid, it was, I mean, Nirvana when I was super young, but then it was like Marilyn Manson, Nine Inch Nails, Corn. you know, some of these like in my darker, more emo phase <laughs> in life, you know, and listening to this kind of music, you know, EDM, that kind of jazz and, uh, and just saying, oh, well, she's just exploring her emotions right now through music. Mm-hmm. And this is what she's enjoying and just listening to it and being like, okay, <laughs> like, this is what I'm going to listen to this <laughs> just be interested. Mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely. It's so much. There's so much value in music. It's such a method of communication. Like you said, you know, the emo phase that we all went through. I find that for myself personally, music is a fantastic coping skill. Mm. And in my prior lifetime ago, and by a prior lifetime, I mean like three years ago, I used to work for a uh, agency that specialized in high-risk clients. So it was a lot of hospitalizations. It was a lot of uh, close monitoring. I was working child and adolescent. So my youngest client was five. My oldest was 18 by the time they would graduate out. And one of the greatest ways to communicate with adolescents is to bond over their music. Uh, That being said, I had a lot of rough days after work. There's nothing like closing out your work day by talking to child protective services. And then you need to go home and pretend you have a normal job. So I would drive home and that's when I would really I would embrace my emo phase music extremely loudly. And by the time I get home, I felt a little better. I can imagine, I can imagine a world where, uh, you know, for, for this house, music is really important. You know, I met my wife doing um, jazz dance. So this is like Lindy Hop and Balboa. So it's always been a part of us. We have, you know, we're those people. We have a record player in the main room and we'll put on a record for dinner, right? <laughs> so we're, we're those kind of people. Uh, the house is sort of taken by storm by like Moana and Hamilton and all the, you know, all the musicals. And we, we put, we play all those things. And then we even, again, we're even those people where we have the vinyl subscription. So every month we get a new <laughs> like variety of vinyl <laughs> that just comes in and we're exploring like, it's been a lot of like grooviness and, and stuff like that. Uh, just kind of different chill vibes. So I completely understand that perspective. So, so let's turn it into, and please excuse uh, feel good fathers, Luna. She's just making herself known. Uh, let's excuse. Um, uh, sorry. Let's get back to our kids. Let's get back to how they're going to communicate with us. So we talked about music. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're developing, I always think of it as taste. They're developing taste in music. They're developing um, the capacity to express what they want. What are other ways that our kids are going to communicate with us that we should be paying attention to? Well, and within music, I would, I would say paying attention to what they are listening to and the lyrics that they are listening to, just because a... And you know this from our growing up, just because you're listening to violent lyrics, contrary to what Tipper Gore thought, doesn't mean you're going to create acts of violence. However, it can be an indication that an adolescent is experiencing strong negative emotions. So 
if you find where they are listening to dark lyrics that do glorify suicidality or self-harm, that doesn't mean you bring them to the hospital. It's an information point. If they're dressing in that emo type clothing, the black clothes, that's an information point. Um, Speaking to suicidality or self-harm, if you find your child dressing in clothes inappropriate to the weather, that can be another information point. So if it's 95 degrees out and your child is wearing a hoodie sweatshirt and sweatpants, it can be an indication that they are trying to hide something from you. Now, I have had parents who have in, in, I'm a parent. I appreciate how scary it is when our kids are dysregulated. One of the things that I will talk with parents about that I completely understand is we are only as happy as our unhappiest child. And so when we see our child exhibiting signs where they might be super sad or super unhappy or in danger of something that I saw on, I don't know, not Oprah, whatever the Oprah version is today, um, that I make them disrobe in front of me so I can see their skin. This is not mental health appropriate. This is further traumatizing. Again, getting back to communication, it's, hey, how you doing today? What's going on? I, I'm noticing you're, you know, you're dressed for December 15th and it's June 15th. What's going on? How do you, how do you, uh, <laughs> how do you communicate and get past, I'm fine? Okay, cool. I'm glad you're fine. Can you tell me what's going on today? That's great. Really great. Uh, really great response there. Love it. Um, so you mentioned dysregulation. Uh, I've just been learning about the sympathetic nervous system and some other elements. Can you talk a little bit about uh, helping, like teaching kids regulating activities and regulating techniques? So we do do a lot of regulation in our sessions and with my, with my clients, I have various coping mechanisms that we work on with our younger kids. It can be as simple as collecting things to help them learn to self-manage. So like it might be fidget toys or it can be, um, kinetic sand is great or stress balls. Um, it can be scented. There you go. It can be scented candles. Um, whatever is going to help to the child to self-soothe. Uh, when you've got a child who's really angry, one of the things that we might recommend is to suck on like one of the, uh, like a warhead or a lemon drop candy because it will refocus their brain from whatever is making them super escalated to the strong taste in their mouth. That's, that's fascinating. So that, that sounds to me like a mindfulness technique. Exactly. It sounds to me like, uh, you know, one of the, the classic examples of developing mindfulness is like, hold the grape, squeeze the grape, you know, smell the grape, taste the grape, put it in, like chew the grape for a little bit. How does it feel in your mouth? Blah, 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 blah. Like all these different things about developing, uh, what we're talking about there is developing presence. And, um, so when I was in college, I, I worked at a summer camp, it's called super camp. It's from the learning forum. It's a great place. And we talked a lot about, um, uh, being present. So we use like NLP techniques. And so we did like body language to help, you know, like if you had, if you're, I do. And, and what I'm for the listeners, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of like straightening my posture. I'm going into like gorilla mode, like 
pushing my chest out and sitting with really great posture. It's like, if you do this in a group of like with kids and they have some sort of like affinity or relationship with you and you do this and then you like lean in and you like look very intently in a direction, almost every, like anybody that's clued into you is going to like look in that same direction. So you can, it's kind of a leading mechanism, right? When you think of, I don't know, I was thinking, we also just watched Tarzan recently and I was thinking about like, you know, I forget what the main gorilla's name is, but like he does the same thing. Um, I, I love that. I love the, um, you're kind of distracting the emotion in the brain with a physical stimulus. Mm -hmm. So that, that's pretty good. Uh, how do you, and, and maybe this is, this is just a, a curious question, right? There's also, a, a practice of you're creating a physical reaction slash habit mm -hmm. with a reaction, right? So this is like totally atomic habits where, such and such happen, you have a trigger, then you create a response, right? So, you know, if you walk in and then you always have candy on the kitchen table, then whenever you walk into the kitchen and you see the candy, you're going to say, oh, I'm going to have a gummy or have a, a mint or whatever. That's just mm -hmm. going to be the basic activity. Whereas if you replace that with fruit, then you can kind of fix that. So I was thinking about um, I love the strong flavor of the mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, but I always feel much better. And I'm, and for the listeners, I'm showing my little stress ball. I have a little, um, I actually bought these for, um, uh, hand strength stuff, but I'm realizing the, just keeping my self fidgety and just like giving my hands things to do. What would be the action there? Like, is it, uh, is it strong and okay to replace it with a, a flavor or a taste as like, as a jolt of, of extra sugar and stuff, or do we want to anchor it to something different? Well, what we're talking about is <clears throat> not every coping skill is going to work with every mood. So like I mentioned the music earlier, I my I my phone i have probably two dozen playlists and that's because sometimes i'm feeling angry or stressed and i want to listen to super chill music uh, put on some grateful dead put on some fish what have you and sometimes i can feel those exact same stressed emotions and that music will really make me angry and it doesn't mean that that music is inherently bad. It means that it's not working for what I need it to at this time. So I'll switch from my jam bands, maybe over to more metal or rock, and that might help my mood. If we try an intervention that's not working, we don't double down and triple down during the intervention to work. Right. We try it. We try something different. Now, I want to make sure I explain that there is a difference between an intervention not working and an intervention working less than we wish it to. Hmm. So, like, when there are a lot of clients who will tell me that square breathing, the act of Breathe in slowly for four seconds, hold it for a few seconds, breathe out slowly for a few seconds, hold it for a few seconds, so on and so forth, that that doesn't work for me. I never feel better after that. Okay. Maybe that's true. However, is it also possible that you feel better, but not as better as you had hoped for? Because there's a difference. And if my anger is at 10 and square breathing takes me down to nine, hmm. I'm better. I'm not good, but I'm better. So maybe after when I'm at nine, I start to distract myself with a uh, countdown grounding to distract myself from whatever my emotions are. And countdown grounding is the act of notice five things that you can see in the room. Mm. Uh, listen to four things that you can hear nearby. Find three things that you can feel and notice their texture. Uh, what are uh, two things that you can uh, 
smell, and what's one thing that you can taste. And usually by the end of those, what was bothering you, you will simply have forgotten about. A uh, variation on that is picking a color at random and noticing around the room things that have that color. So I picked the color blue. Uh, I've got a globe over there. I've got a sign over there. I've got a stuffed animal over there. And the great thing about the count on grounding and the picking a color to count that you can find in the room is that we can be anywhere and feel heightened dysregulation, feel angry, feel upset, and engage in these techniques. And no one is going to know that we're doing that. Hmm. You can be sitting in a meeting and your boss is blathering on and you were supposed to leave 20 minutes ago and you're getting more and more angry, but you know, by popping off at your boss, you're going to be looking for work tomorrow. You can engage in these interventions, do the square breathing, do the mindfulness, do the uh, distract distraction techniques. So you can settle down because Part of what we're doing in developing these distractions is hopefully as we learn them, we're teaching our children that it's okay to feel emotions. Emotions aren't bad. It's how we regulate our emotions that are just as important. So with a one and a half year old, you're not going to get an 18 month year old or an 18 month old child to be an insightful person. It's not physiologically a realistic possibility. However, as they hit five, six, seven, as their emotional intelligence is growing, teaching them and having conversations with them where if, if you pop off at your kids and I know I have before, and you realize two seconds after that, oh God, I shouldn't have done that. Having the ability to say, you know what? I yelled at you about your toy room being a mess and I was over the top. You know what? Your toy room is a mess and I do need you to clean it up, please. And I shouldn't have yelled at you the way I did. I am so sorry. And then have a conversation about it. Your kid generally, unless it's a pattern, is going to say that's okay or something to that effect. And as you're teaching them emotional regulation, you can explain why it's actually not okay. And making sure you're ending with, <clears throat> I need you to know that I love you and you are so important to me. And then moving on. And the more you teach that, the more you teach your child <clears throat> that we can have strong emotions no matter how old we are. Mm. And that we need to be accountable to our own emotions. The more they are going to learn not through direct instruction, but through modeling how to engage with the world. I'm, I'm really curious because we're in feel good fatherhood. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious about the socialization of emotion for young men. Right. And I, and I think mm -hmm. because we have both sons and daughters on the show, I'd love to understand the difference. And I know that you see, and so where you feel comfortable, I would love to have an understanding of um, what what do you see as this sort of education, this emotional intelligence for our young boys, and then what do you see for our young girls? Uh, <clears throat> not only do I have sons and daughters at home, <clears throat> I also have many young people of all genders on my caseload. And I have to say that boys and girls 
while they have differences around the edges, aren't dramatically different unless we raise them to be different. Right. Right. And so, um, I love that. That's super, super cool. I remember I was reading Dr. Steven. He has the nature nurture Nietzsche, uh, newsletter on Substack. Substack. He talks about, um, that, uh, it was about perceiving emotion. And he said, there was actually no discernible difference in between, and this was like middle age, I guess middle age is not appropriate, but like, uh, 20 to 30 year old capacity for looking at somebody and detecting what emotion they were feeling. But there was certainly a, a huge difference in how either would respond socially, right? Mm-hmm. Gentlemen are, are socialized to a certain response. Um, you know, uh, uh, ladies are socialized to a, a separate kind of response. So then what, uh, just super quickly then, uh, this is, this is fascinating. So, so what, um, what do we do then? Like with our kids then? I think emotional intelligence has a direct correlation to emotional intelligence in the home that they're growing up in. A child, regardless of what their gender assigned at birth is, is going to be more willing to express emotions if they grow up in a home that encourages healthy demonstration and dialogue around emotions. Uh, Like I've said before on here today, there are no bad emotions. Emotions are just what they are. And how we express them is sometimes where we might get into trouble. So if you have a boy who you're raising to be stoic and rigid and that man who does not share emotionally, you can do that and society in certain ways will validate you for that but your child if they're pre-programmed to be more emotional they're still going to have those emotions they're just going to burn a hole in their stomach managing it and if you're raising girls and you raise them to be proper and well-behaved and, you know, prim little cupie dolls. And their natural tendency is to be more aggressive in their play style. You can, you can bend them to your will, but it's not going to change who they are. So who this we is, are by tendency is who we are by tendency. I love it. I love this. So part of this is pay attention to your kids, their temperament and what they enjoy doing. Absolutely love it. Right. But I, you said something I thought was the most important piece of, of this whole discussion, which is your emotional intelligence is directly co- correlated to emotional intelligence at home. Mm-hmm. So as a father, right? what are, what are some simple skills, techniques, or thought patterns, whatever, where we can become more emotionally intelligent? Again, it comes down to listening. Um, bedtime in our house is usually check-ins on the day. What went well today? What did you enjoy about today? What are things that we need to talk about? Uh, at mealtime when we're together, we have an absolutely no device rule. So I don't want to see a single screen. And if that means that we all just sit there and eat uh, like with fish eyes, so be it. However, that almost never, ever has happened. And just by, just by asking our kids, questions that they are interested in 
we can have such wonderful conversations. And sometimes dinner time gets a little bit goofier than we planned on. And that's okay. If dinner takes a few minutes longer or maybe some food falls on the floor or you know, whatever happens, it's not the end of the world. It's building a relationship to your child. It's building a connection to your child. It's making your child feel connected to you. All yeah. these all these small things, all these micro events are how you build the connections, how you get your kids to talk to you about the hard conversations about uh, the this kid in my school uh, told me to join them in the bathroom because they have a vape. That's a huge conversation for us. But in a middle school, it's really not. It is for the administration. But if your child is surrounded by kids who are vaping in the bathroom and you're not having those discussions because they're scary or uncomfortable, your kid and you have this regimented home where, you know, father's rules are law and we do not have tough conversations. We just do what we are told to do. Mm. Then all you're teaching your kid is to keep secrets. Uh, parents who take away their uh, their kids' cell phones because their kid sass them. If you think your kid doesn't have a burner phone somewhere, you're sadly mistaken. And the next generation of Apple, uh, I think iOS 18 I just read, they are going to let people change the skins for their various apps. So we are, we as parents are going to have no hope of knowing what's going on in our kids' lives if they do not feel comfortable letting us in. That is, I, I think that's super great. Like that's a such a critical, I think, piece of information to know and understand. I recall back in the day, uh, my daughter would play like Minecraft and um, Portal Knights, sleeper hit, Portal Knights, super inexpensive, third person Minecraft game, super great. Um, and because she was on the PlayStation, there were conversations and you could friend people and just in the system incentivizes connection in that way. And I remember in, in that conversation that there were people and I said, one of the things to her, I said, is I gave her a, a job. Mm -hmm. I said, we don't really feel comfortable with you developing these relationships because this is like the front door, this, this system, like your phone the PlayStation, your computer, it's like a front door into the home. And because of the nature of this technology, you don't, number one, you don't really know who's on the other side and you don't know what kind of energy you're bringing into the house. Right. And so I said, one of the things for you is that you're now a custodian. You're now a guardian um, on this device for the home because you are picking who you're letting in. And so you have to think about how do you feel about them? Are they saying good things? Are they presenting, right? Are they presenting a good thing? Do they skeeve you out? Are they mean to you? Like just kind of like regular, regular, you know, six, six to eight year old conversations. Right. Um, a bit earlier than I wanted to, uh, to have that, that particular conversation. Uh, but I think it's done, it's done really well because she's learned that boundary, right? She's, she's had um, a handful of friends that, are not good for her and that she said, Hey, I need you to, I'm, I'm not interested in listening to this conversation anymore. And so she's just left, left the conversation. And then we're learning about that, that little level of discernment. So I really love this. I think that we're really into a lot of really great, interesting rules about paying attention. Uh, I think the term is mattering, making your kids matter. Uh, we talk a lot in the feel good fatherhood community about, um, be the dog that wags the tail when they come in, 
like just be excited to see them, excited to hear about them, excited to, you know, uh, I was going to say sniff them, but like that's just a little bit too doggy, too doggy in that moment. Uh, but just listening to them, paying attention to them, making sure that they feel mattered, uh, that they matter to the house. Uh, our yeah, second- it's funny you mention that. Yesterday I had a very, I had a unique situation that I haven't had for a while. My oldest is turning 11 in just about a month. So way too cool for the room. And I'm used to it and I haven't accepted it, but I have still one of those parenting curses. And I had to run out yesterday for 20 minutes just to get a passport photo. And um, I came back in and it was the almost 11 year old who noticed me first and screamed, Daddy's back and ran and hugged me like I haven't seen in years. Mm. And it was such a cool experience. And I forgot how much I missed it because she's so emotive and so strong that having this little tween show just a glimpse of her younger self really filled my cup in that moment. That's awesome. And I, I think a lot about the the other side of that is like being able to do that for, for our kids. Right. Um, so the, the second piece would be discipline. Just a, just a, let's have mm-hmm. a, a quick discussion on discipline here. What are, what are the key things to understand about effective discipline? So effective discipline does not, will not ever include corporal punishment. Corporal punishment is always a negative form of communication. This is not a stance that I have that brings a lot of parents positivity towards my position. Um, But I have worked with a lot, lot of parents on learning to unwind corporal punishment as a key form of discipline. And I'm talking about a whole lot of people who came to me with the stance of spare the rod, spoil the child. I, I grew up like this. What's good enough for me is good enough for them. Um, I, it didn't mess me up. And in fact, sometimes just because we've gotten used to our trauma, we forget that it is still trauma. There are libraries filled with books that indicate that when we engage in corporal punishment with our children, our children's brains go into fight or flight mode. Let's let's define let's define corporal punishment. Let's like so maybe maybe this. I'm receiving this as you make a mistake everything is shut down and you're grounded, you know, but that is not corporal punishment. Uh, I would argue that's excessive. Um, one, one of the things that I encourage parents when we're setting goals for parenting, when we're setting goals for correcting behaviors is we want to embrace smart goals. And what smart stands for is specific manageable, achievable, realistic, and time sensitive. So if you're trying to accomplish a goal, give me an example of something a child might get grounded for. Um, so sneaking a phone into the room or sneaking a device into the room to stay up late. Okay. How old is a child? Uh, 12. That's fair. So is this something that you've discussed with the child beforehand? Yes. Okay. My first question is, or my first goal is to collect information. The only way to collect information is to be not yelling. Sure. And that is a way more difficult task than we care to admit. So we go into the kid's bedroom because we see they're still up. 
we go in, they're hiding under the covers, and you see the blue light, you pull out the blanket, you know the rules, what's going on? Well, and they're going to just blather, wait till they're done blathering. I need to know why you have your phone with you, your iPad with you, your tablet with you. And they're going to give whatever their reason is. <clears throat> and I'm guessing to them, it is an incredibly important reason. Even if we don't feel that it is a justified reason. Now, in our household, our kids know that as soon as we go to bed, devices stay outside of the bedroom because nothing good is happening on the internet after midnight. Nothing. And so you've got you've got this 12-year-old who disobeys the rules. They know it's a rule. So we've talked about this before. This is not the first time we've had this discussion. Tell me a good reason why you should maintain privileges to your device. And let them explain themselves. And if the goal is to maintain communication, you are going to listen to what they say. You are going to mirror back what they say in order to die, in order to demonstrate that you are listening and that you are hearing. Uh, this, is, this is a very basic clinical tool called motivational interviewing, which anyone who's bought a car from a dealership ever has been exposed to. It's the idea of selling our own goals back to us. Hmm. And if you can have that reasonable discussion with your child and say, okay, at the end of the whole discussion, I know that you need <clears throat> your tablet for uh, 12 years old, their fifth, sixth grade, they probably have homework to do. Uh, they may have other type things that are more required for outside uh, interventions. Um, I want you to do it for the next week. I want you doing all your homework at the kitchen table. So we can watch what's going on. Um, and outside of uh, stuff at the kitchen table, you get one hour per night to communicate to who you need to do what you need to do. But one of us needs to be around. I'm not going to look over your screen because honestly, there's nothing on your screen that I really care to know unless you give me reason that I need to know and they'll know what that means. But it's got to be offense after offense after offense. And if it's getting into being that many offenses, then I'm starting to realize that I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if we keep working together and you keep overtly disobeying me, then there is a communication gap. And there is something that I'm not doing that's causing you to distrust me, that's causing you to not work with me. My oldest is an athlete. So on practice nights, my oldest gets home after dinner. So they get longer tablet time because they, they are out that much later with their activities. They also know that at 10 o'clock, boom, we take the device and that's that. Having standard expectations, having standard uh, rules in the home. We know that you know, 
bedtime every night. We go up at 845. We're going to wash. We're going to brush teeth. We're going to get on pajamas. We're going to talk. We're going to go to bed. This is every single night, Monday through Sunday. Unless we're out at like some sort of performance or something where the family is together out until nine o'clock, which is not often, but it happens. My kids know 845, bop, 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 bop. They know what to expect. Children not only benefit from routine, but they thrive in routine. Children become dysregulated when they don't know what's going to happen next. <clears throat> so this is a, this kind of cooks into better childhood discipline, parent engagement is if you have predictability, you are going to have more efficient communication with your child. Um, picture going to your job and your boss is unhinged and maybe if i come in five minutes late today he's gonna say look i need you to stay five minutes after tonight just to make up the time and then tomorrow you come in four minutes late and he's threatening to fire you so someone might argue well that's clearly a pattern of improper behavior but is it going to make you want to do your day's work? Hmm. Probably not. If a child knows I can talk to my parent about this thing, even if I did wrong, that we're going to dialogue on it and we're, you know, my parents are going to hear my side and they're not going to go off half cocked and start yelling and screaming and carrying on, they're going to be more likely to come to you when Johnny down the street says, hey, let's play truth or dare. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. I think, um, man, this has been, there's been so much in here. There's like so much like actual insight. There's so much like perspective. Um, I think so, Wayne. If if the feel good father is right, they want to get a hold of you. Maybe want to learn a little bit more about what you're doing, and maybe even learn some more of these techniques. Where can they Where can they find you? Where can they get a hold of you? You can go to www.willowgrovecounseling.net. Uh, I have a whole bunch of podcasts, including this one, will eventually post, and. I keep a blog on there. I don't post on there as much as I would like, but there is a ton of free content. None of it is charged. And if someone is looking for feedback, I'm more than happy to help them. If you have uh, businesses in the, in the Feel Good Fatherhood Network who are looking for advice or consultation, that is something that I offer. Um, I do have a staff of therapists who work with me and anyone who is living and working in New York state, we can work with, we do have, uh, counselors who are taking clients right now. Again, we're only licensed in New York state. So I apologize to those in Tennessee, but I'm more than happy to, work with you to bounce ideas off of people. Um, and like I said, if a business is looking for help or insight on ways to help with positive feedback with uh, employees, with clients, what have you, that is something that I'm more than happy to help with. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that, Wayne. Uh, Wayne Brown, everybody. <laughs>